Windows 7 is now end of life. It is a dead operating system and you need alternatives. So my whole shtick on this channel is to give you choice. I wanna give you the options to choose whatever you wanna choose, but at least I want you to know what those options are. So in this video, I wanna lay out four options for a Windows 7 user that needs to switch. So there's those options are gonna be first, number one, customizing a stock Windows 10. I've gone over this extensively on the channel with customizing an ISO to where you can install it or just go ahead and taking a stock version of Windows. This isn't quite as clean, but you can remove some of the garbage that comes in with it. And then option number two is gonna be that enterprise version of uh, Windows. And I, I'll go a little bit into like licensing and things, but if you really wanna do a deep dive there and understand how to acquire licensing and all that, uh, I have made videos about that. And I'll put all of these uh, other videos that might go down that specific path in the description. So you can easily follow along um, the, based on your needs. And then option number three is going to be using like a user modified version of Windows. Uh, there's one floating around called Windows AME. And then the fourth option is going to be Linux and kind of going over what that journey is like. So a lot to unpack in this video. Let's just go ahead and get into it. This video is brought to you by CDN77, the content delivery network used by space agencies and CentOS. I also am using this on ChrisTitus.com to speed up my website. So if you're interested in this, click the link in the description. All right, so the very first option we have is customizing your existing Windows 10 install. Let's say you have Windows 7, you can still upgrade to Windows 10 for free. Uh, most people don't realize you just can use that Windows 7 license on Windows 10 and it'll actually upgrade, which is kind of nice. Uh, so you're not spending $200 on a Windows uh, 10 product. So with that, you install Windows 10, you get it up and going. What is uh, What are the methods of doing such a thing? So the first method, which is what I recommend, is completely wipe out the system, build a custom ISO for Windows 10. Uh, I went into an extensive video where I customized the entire ISO and, and really make that faster, lighter, perfect install of Windows 10 with not a lot of the junk that comes with it. So I'll link that in the description and also the title card up here. So once you have that, you could install it. So let's say you, you'd like, you know what, that's a little too much work for me, Titus. What are my other options? So let's say you don't want to create the custom Windows image. Uh, you can easily go ahead and start installing the stock Windows 10 experience and stripping that down. I've made PowerShell scripts and also uh, utilizing some third party tools like Ono oh Shut Up to kind of minimize a lot of the garbage that comes with Windows 10. And I did that in Clean Up Windows 10 video, which I will also link up here. So if this is more your speed, you can definitely follow any of these videos and achieve that goal of a regular stock Windows 10 experience that just doesn't suck as bad as the what you get from Microsoft. So these are good approved methods just because you're in charge of what goes on your system. Uh, the downside to this is you do have still a lot of that underlying problems with uh, Microsoft having some telemetry and some other uh, garbage that gets reinstalled. So like when a feature update comes through on Windows, which happens every six months, well, a lot of these things are going to get reinstalled and you're going to have to re-clean up your Windows 10. So that's really the first option is using your own customized version of Windows 10. Uh, I personally recommend this option just because, again, you're the one doing it. Option number two is Enterprise Linux. Now this is often referred to as LTSC for Long-Term Servicing Channel or LTSB for Long-Term Servicing Branch. LTSB is 2015 and 2016 versions and all the latest versions like 2019 is considered LTSC. They're really the same thing. And what it is, is it's an Enterprise Linux that doesn't come with a bunch of junk on it. It doesn't come with Edge. It doesn't come with a Microsoft Store. And this is a great solution. However, the licensing is tricky. So uh, acquiring one of these enterprise licenses can be a bit of a circus. But I went into that in a video. Definitely refer to that if you're going to go down this path. The one caveat I will say about LTSC is simply this. It doesn't come with a Microsoft Store. So if you want Microsoft apps from the store, 
it doesn't offer that. So uh, you really can't install, like let's say, some Microsoft Store dependent apps. There's a couple that have been exclusive to the Microsoft Store. I don't particularly ever use any. The enterprise solution would probably be my best Windows 10 solution that I'd actually recommend. However, I wanna caution people against using pirate pirated version of a Windows 10. Piracy equals virus, spyware, everything worse than Microsoft spying on you. I'd rather have Microsoft spy on me with their stuff than use a pirated ones that might be doing crypto mining. It might wait a little bit and then do a ransomware attack on me. There's a lot of bad things come from pirated versions of Windows 10. So don't ever use a pirated version of Windows 10, period. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, the worst case uh, scenario here is you really run into a lot of problems with pirated versions. I can't think of one that I would say, hey, this is okay. So don't ever use pirated Windows 10. So with that said, that brings us to our next Windows 10 option, and that is Windows AME. Now this is a really interesting version. I got it in a YouTube comment. I didn't even know it existed until you know a month or two ago. And I got to say, this is an interesting one. They strip out Windows updates. They strip out Cortana. They strip out Edge. They strip out the store. They strip out all the garbage in Windows 10. But the problem with this version is simply, well, it is maintained by someone I don't know. And it's a third party. And you can't really update the thing easily. You have to download the entire update package from Microsoft into a cab file, extract that cab file, and then integrate it into your system. And yeah, that, it, it's just way more than an average user will do. So I know what's going to happen if a user uses AME. They're going to install it. They're going to go, hey, everything's fast. Everything's clean. Everything works great. And then it's going to slow down over time. It's going to get infected and bad things are going to happen because it gets absolutely zero updates. And uh, in my opinion, if you're going to go to the AME approach, well, I mean, heck, you might as well just stay on Windows 7 because you're really not going to get the servicing updates that you need. And uh, that's a big problem. So uh, Windows AME uh, is not a really great solution. I did an entire live stream about three or four hours really diving deep into AME. And I actually have it on this test box right now as I was dual booting to it. And overall, I just, it works. And if you're really, really, really advanced with Windows, you can get in and do the updates and keep it kind of clean. But uh, for 99% of the users out there, I'm going to just say this really isn't an option, even though it's kind of tossed around the net a little bit as I don't recommend anything that's maintained by some unknown third party. And now the fourth and final version of this, uh, the option that you can choose is Linux. Now Linux is by far my favorite option out of all four of these, as you get to control and customize everything, which is fantastic. And I recently, as a lifelong Windows user, switched to Linux. Most of the video content on this channel is about Linux. And the reason for that is because Linux is awesome. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can do. Um, you can customize anything, whether it's the display renderer, whether it's the, the login screen, whether it's just the look and feel, how windows pop up. You can do window managers. You can do all kinds of just craziness, which is fantastic. But, and this is a big but, there are some things you can't do. And I wanna just go ahead and lay those out because you might fall into one of these camps. And uh, I definitely fell into a couple of these camps and I'm gonna tell you what I did. So reason number one is gaming. Gaming on Linux has come a long ways. When I started on Linux back in the late 2018s, early 2019 is really, I was full-timing Linux. It was at like 30% of my gaming library played on Linux. Right now it's sitting in the mid seventies right now. So amazing turnaround between back then and now. Literally more than double the actual game library is playable. So that's great. But I didn't say it's 100%. And the reason is there's some games that I still can't play. Uh, just to name a few, uh, some of the big titles that I still would use Windows for. Destiny 2, Red Dead Redemption, Apex Legends, Bat PUBG, Fortnite, uh, you know, these types of games use easy anti-cheat and also uh, have some issues running on Linux natively. So 
Uh, that's just a very short list. There's more, but these are the games that I would typically want to play and just haven't been able to play directly on Linux. Now, how did I get around that? Well, I still dual boot. So I still have a partition that has Windows on it, and I boot into that when I want to play these games. Now, that's one method of doing it. Some people do like a virtual machine and just never leave Linux. Uh, there's a lot of workarounds here, but I want to at least say this is an issue and one that uh, you do have to do workarounds to, to, do, to utilize, and that does usually entail using Windows still. But it's been several months before I really had to jump into Windows to, to do that. And typically, I would just boot into this partition and uh, load up Windows, play like Red Dead Redemption 2 with a buddy online. And then when I'm done, I would boot back into Linux. So uh, that's my solution. But, you know, everyone has their own. So that's number one. Number two is the Office Suite and also the Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, these are big deals. Now, if it's an old version of Office, like Office 2010, you can emulate that in Windows. But let's say you have something recent, like Office 365, and it's a subscription-based model. That's going to be a problem. You can't run that in Linux. Same with Adobe. If you're big into Premiere, Photoshop, and those types of things, that's an issue. You can't run this natively in Linux. Now, I was a big uh, Photoshop junkie, and I hated GIMP, and a lot of people have fallen in this camp. I've since transitioned off this. I, I don't use Photoshop anymore, and I actually use GIMP. I never thought I'd say that because literally uh, the first 30 days of my Linux journey, which I documented on this channel, I was constantly railing on GIMP. I think I was really, really harsh for that first two months where I was just like, I hate GIMP. Uh, why am I doing this to myself? And then uh, something just clicked and just snapped one day, and now... Even if I'm on Windows, I'm loading up GIMP and using it. I literally never thought I'd say that. And really, the, the last consideration when switching to Linux is hardware support. Now, most of every uh, modern hardware is supported in Linux. There's not much that isn't. However, I wanted to go over some things that you might run into problems with. Uh, I have a little Stream Deck here, as you noticed. That is needs like a... a third-party GitHub project to make work. It's a little hacky solution right now to really utilize it on Linux. And it just keeps getting better and better every month, but it's still not fully baked. So there's certain kind of obscure peripherals that you might have problems with. Another good one is like if you have a gaming mouse or something, this is just a regular Logitech mouse. But if you had a really big gaming mouse with like nine buttons and really crazy features like RGB and you wanted to change that to green, Typically, those applications are Windows only, so it's kind of uh, you lose some of that functionality. The mouse itself will still work, but some of those uh, really neat features that are integrated with uh, that peripherals product uh, will we'll miss out. Now, I don't consider this such a bad thing just because you really shouldn't be running all this crap. Like Windows, I go to a hardcore gamer's computer and almost immediately I'm like, oh my god, how many programs do you have running this is such a waste of your PC. And I fall, I, a lot of these utilities that changes the color of your keyboard and mouse and these types of things, I really don't think should be running all the time. And one of my big gripes about Windows, uh, where Linux, yes, they don't, they're not compatible, but at the same time, I'm like, you yeah, know, it's kind of a good thing. Um, that's my view on that, but I at least want to you know, make you aware of it and in case you have that and you're like, no, no, no. I absolutely have to have that special shade of blue on my mouse. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to happen on Linux. So with that, you see all this that's happened. What about Linux itself? And I've done a ton of videos on the channel about Linux, as I just said. And I really think it boils down to you get to use your computer how you want to use it. If you don't like the way it looks, you change that. If you don't like the login screen, you change that. If you don't like uh, the way the file explorer looks. Well, you just change the file explorer to be how you want it to look. There's infinite options on Linux. And most people look at this and go, oh, that's too many options because there is a, pretty much anything you can dream up has been done on Linux. And that's what I love about it is I can customize it to however I want, but it does require taking the time and learning those options. And honestly, if you go down this path, you're probably going to be scouring through my libraries. If you go down this path, check out the Linux tutorial playlist. I've any anytime I make a video that's educational, not just me talking like this video is what I consider a talking head video. 
Um, I don't put that in a tutorial playlist, but I do have tutorial playlists where I'm mainly on the actual desktop the entire time. So when I'm mainly on the desktop, that's going to go into that tutorial playlist. That way you can kind of learn things and you'll see through the titles and go, Hey, I want to change the login screen, or I want to change, um, the display render. I want to change my terminal. I want to change my file explorer. You can look through all these and kind of get a good gauge of how to construct your desktop and change Linux the way you want it changed. And I think too many people coming from Windows think of it like, hey, I've always used my computer this way, and now I want to continue using it that way on Linux. And Linux just fundamentally works differently from Windows, and that's a good thing, but it's something that uh, you need to just kind of change a lot of that workflows. But once you kind of throw out that old workflow you had in Windows and you go to Linux, the whole world can unlock for you. It's, it's a, a better solution. And I say that just from my experience. So to just share with you my experience with Linux is uh, I used to make daily YouTube videos. Every single day for 365 days, I made a YouTube video. I was able to do this because of Linux because I was so efficient at just that entire workflow. In Windows, I would not have been able to accomplish this feat. I wouldn't be able to make as much content as I make both Windows and Linux, I still do a lot of Windows content on the channel, but it's a lot of that del deals with how reliable and consistent Linux is. I know I can always just hit the power button on my computer and go. I never have to worry about updates happening at weird times or uh, my computer starting to slow down because of some uh, scan that I didn't authorize happening in the background. All kinds of just shenanigans that happen in Windows don't happen in Linux. And Frankly, once I learned a lot of the software alternatives in Linux, it's just not only a better solution, it just is a lot faster, I'm a lot more efficient, and overall, that's why I love Linux as much as I do. It's not perfect. There's a lot of times I'm like, oh, geez, okay, what software should I use for this? I, I don't know. And uh, going from using uh, OS for 20 plus years, like with Windows. Uh, I've been a Windows user since 3.11 when it was DOS and 3.11, switched uh, over to 95, 98, uh, do I even say ME, uh, 2000, uh, XP, Vista 7, 8.1 for a little bit, and then also 10. I've used all of them extensively for years and years and years, and I can just go I just know it far better than I do Linux today. And that's with me using Linux for a year. And uh, I still love Linux a lot better. So that's just my experiences. I'm not going to ramble on anymore. And uh, if you're interested, let me know in the comments something that might be perplexing you about Linux. Because I'm always curious to see what your headaches are. That's what I want to do. And I want to make more content, something that I hadn't covered. And maybe if I have covered it, I might just reply and say, hey, watch this video. I've already done this. Uh, and it'll kind of just showcase how to do it. Or maybe it'll be something I haven't heard about before. And I would love to make a video about that. So with that said, a big shout out to all my patrons. Without you, I couldn't make videos like this one. And I will see you in the next one.